some of you I know. Uh, I'm Anthony Ard. I run the uh, Goose Goslin chapter of Sabre. We uh, cover like the South Jersey, South New Jersey area. Um, started out in 2018. Uh, before all of this, we were meeting probably once a quarter together, having speakers or just talking baseball. Um, so since then, obviously, I've been trying to get together as much as possible uh, virtually. Um, so, you know, thanks for coming out and, uh, and joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to be doing a Q&A tonight. So if you have any questions, uh, you can feel free to type them in the chat or I think uh, you can raise a hand, right? Yep, right, raise Jim? a hand, yep, sure. Um, so you can raise a hand and, uh, and speak and, and ask a question yourself. And uh, we'll be doing this for about an hour. Um, but uh, so with that, I just want to introduce uh, Mitch Nathanson and thank him for uh, taking the time to join us tonight a little background on him. He's a professor of law at Villanova University right over in, uh, in PA, and the author of numerous books and articles on baseball, the law and society. He is a two-time winner of the McFarland Sabre Award. His book, Dick Allen, God Almighty Himself, The Life and Legacy of Dick Allen, um, which I'm currently reading, it's really good, was a finalist for the 2017 uh, Seymour Medal. He has a new book out, uh, Bowton, The Life of a Baseball Original, uh, which is actually, I don't know if you know this, Mitch, but I saw it's one of the 100 best baseball books of all time from uh, Book Authority. So congratulations. That would be great, um, except that one of them, I think, is a basketball book. <laughs> <laughs> that is so a bit of a mistake there. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but again, thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, just to get things started, I, I just wanted to um, hear hear your story or how or what sparked your interest in baseball. So I was always interested in in baseball. I've always been a Phillies fan, and um, I was a Phillies fan since the the, the early '70s when I was a little kid. And um, so it was great to be a Phillies fan when I was a kid because. I first got into baseball in the early seventies and the Phillies were in last place. And then every year it seemed they got better. You know, they went, they were in third and then they were in second and then they were in first. And then they had all these years where they kept losing in the playoffs and then they win the world series. And it was like, Oh, it's great to be a Phillies fan. Cause they always win. I mean, it's always, it's, it's an upward trajectory, right? I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't until, you know, the eighties came, it was a different story. Um, you know, we hit the Steve Jelch years and it was a whole other ball game. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I was always was a, was a, was a baseball fan and a Phillies fan. And um, so then when I um, started working, teaching at Villanova, um, you know, you, you're supposed to write on something, you know? And so I was thinking, what would, what would I write about? And so I like baseball and I was a law professor. And so I could see if I could marry the two of those. And so that's what I started doing. And so that I st my early stuff was a lot of law-based stuff like that McFarland Sabre stuff. That's all like on the antitrust exemption, um, which is, it's a, I think it was pretty interesting. At least I thought it was interesting, but, um, um, but then I started branching out into more of just baseball and um, that's how the Dick Allen book, and I, I wrote a book on the 77 Phillies, Black Friday Phillies, um, which I think scarred me as a child. Uh, but, um, <laughs> so I wanted to, I went through therapy by, by writing that book. And then I, I, I got that out of my system. And then that's how I, you know, I started thinking about other things. And that's how I wrote the Dick Allen one, and then uh, another one, and then, um, and then the, now the Batten one. So, Go ahead, Jim. No, I was just going to follow up on that with your about the 77 Philly. So I read the part where Greg Luzinski was not too happy about that. What was, what was that all about? I mean, not too happy with about about with, with me or with. Uh... Well, maybe it was the other book. Maybe it was on on the 2000. It was maybe it was another book article you read that there was some about Philly. Well, he team. gave me I got the double barreled middle finger from him. Oh, for um, what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was on with, I was on um, uh, Angelo with Angelo Cataldi 
um, this was this is about a decade ago, I guess, right? Probably twelve. The book came out in twenty oh eight, right? So yeah. Oh yeah. And um, so I I was on um, the morning whatever he's got there with um, you know um, Rhea Hughes and and Morganti and those guys, and um, so they had Lazinski on, and they they didn't tell Lazinski that I was going to be there. And, and so I mean, they, they ambushed him and, and um, he was there. It was like opening day, I think. And, and he was there, he was there promoting Bulls barbecue. And, um, and, and, and so they had him on for a segment. They did this at Chickie and Pete's. And um, so I'm sitting there, you know, as they're doing this and I see he's on and they didn't tell me that he was going to be on either. And so <laughs> Um, I mean, it's pure Angelo Cataldi garbage. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> he didn't tell me and he didn't tell Lazinski. And I get there and Lazinski's being interviewed, which is no big deal because he's talking about his sauce and whatever. He's selling a sauce or something. And then I, they go to a break and then uh, Rhea Hughes comes over and says, oh, come on, we want you on now. I was like, well, he's Lazinski's talking. Like, no, we want you on with Lazinski. I was like, why would you do that? And um, It'll be good anyway. So they ambushed him, and but amb they really ambushed him more than me. And then they brought up Black Friday, and Lazinski turned to me and just just gave me the double barrel finger. And um, so you know, it's radio, so of course nobody could see that. And um, but of course, Catality says, "Well, there's uh, the bull telling Mitch he uh, he thinks he's number one." So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was that. And and Lazinski. He was he he was pissed, and um, I do I do have to say he was a very nice guy, um, okay. and he took it as well as you could take it. Um, but he, even during that segment, um, he insisted he caught the ball, um, <laughs> to which I said, you know, every time I watch the uh, replay of that, I think you're going to catch the ball too. But but every time you throw, <laughs> you, know, you trap it against the wall. <laughs> Um, he didn't like that, but he was—he was a good sport. Um, he, I have to say, he—he he really was. And um, yeah, I, I liked Blazinski before then. I like him more now. So yeah, that wasn't his fault anyway. Black Friday was his yeah. fault. So um, one of my questions is, you know, what what made you want to write about Dick Allen? Was it just you were a fan of him, you're as a Phillies fan, or? because of you know the type of player he was and and all that surrounded him was there a specific reason you wanted to write about him and you know what went behind that so so that connects to this 77 Phillies book so the 77 Phillies book is really more of a it's sort of a cultural history of the relationship between the city of Philadelphia and its baseball teams, first the A's and then the Phillies. And it's really more about why the city of Philadelphia never really took to the Phillies because the Philadelphia was always, I'm not, I'm sure I'm not telling any, telling anybody anything they don't know here, but you know, um, people who are not in Sabre, um, you know, may have, th may think that, um, you know, it was always a Phillies town, but of course it isn't, it wasn't, it was an A's town. And, and um, and then when the Philly when the A's left, they you know the Phillies you know they had those couple of years they were good the Wiz kids and then they were terrible again and then they had that little period in '64 and 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 so anyway the book is really well why is it that the city of Philadelphia the people of Philadelphia um, never really took to the Phillies um, and and I, as I said in the book you know Philadelphia sports fans of which I am one will boo anything you know, but we boo more for the Phillies. We boo the Phillies harder. We'll, we'll boo anybody when they're losing, but we'll boo the Phillies when they win. And, and that doesn't happen with the Flyers, the Eagles, or the Sixers. Um, and, and if you, anybody who was around in 1980 when the Phillies were um, going through September when they were fighting the Expos to win the division, the crowds were hostile in September. Um, there, you know, Larry Boa gave the finger to the crowd um, in a game in late September when the Phillies were in first place. Um, I mean, that was bizarre. That's bizarre stuff, you know. And so I talked about that, and that was weird. And of course, you can't talk about that without talking about Dick Allen. 
mm-hmm. and um, and how how he was treated in Philly. And I, I'm too young to remember Alan when he was with them in the '60s, but I remember when he came back in the '70s, and I remember the big deal that it was. I didn't really know much about him, and um, I just knew it was a big deal. I knew he was controversial. I didn't really know the story, so I didn't spend a lot of time in that '77 Phillies book about on Dick Allen. It was maybe a page. I got more feedback on that one page than anything else in the book. I got feedback from people telling me, A, um, you don't know what you're talking about. He was an absolute jerk. Or then B, people would say, you don't know what you're talking about. He was the nicest guy in the world. And, and so I was like, wow, this, you know, a half century later, people are really still ar- fighting with each other, arguing with each other. And, and, and so, I didn't know what was right. And so I just started, like, I wanted to know the answer. Like, what, what, what is this with Dick Allen? And um, as I say in the Allen book, I, I, I think you can walk, well, you can't walk into a bar anywhere now, but you, soon you can. But when, when you can walk into a bar again, um, anybody who's talking sports, you bring up the name Dick Allen and people are gonna line up on two sides. This is a half century later. It's still gonna happen. Um, and, and while people may have lined up on two sides when they about when they were talking about Muhammad Ali back in the 70s or the 60s, that's not true anymore. But it is still true with Alan. And so to me, that makes him fascinating. So that's why I wrote the book about Alan, just to try to figure out like well, what was going on there. You know, it was just it's it's a really weird dynamic that continues. It's the st- same dynamic now. Um, and, and it really hasn't changed much, uh, even though. You know, nobody was going to boo him. You know, the last few years of his life, but there were still people. There were still people when he, when they had, they retired his number back in August. There were still people who who, who had to vent about how much they hated him and how much he, they thought he was a cancer in the clubhouse and whatever. So it was it was interesting. Yeah, I I got to be honest. I mean, well, I wasn't around when he played, or but you know, reading your book, I I. I was surprised how controversial he was. I didn't, you know, I, my father liked him growing up, but my grandfather didn't. And Mm -hmm. it was, um, I'm really fine. I really found it interesting just how controversial he was. And that's what, yeah, Yeah. I just find it really amazing because I wasn't there, so. Yeah, well, you know, usually when we think of someone who's controversial, it's kind of a synonym for a bad person, right? Mm -hmm. But he's really controversial, like in the truest sense of the word. I mean, there are people on both sides, very passionate on both sides, you know? And and as I said, to this day, and that's exactly what you said is what you see. Your dad loved him, your grandfather hated him, right? And and nobody's in the middle. Nobody's neutral when it comes to Allen in Philadelphia. It's one or the other. And um, yeah, it's just... Mm -hmm. I, as I as I, I I try to write in the book, I think really it comes down to all of that is more about the people who are making coming up with their opinion, and not so much about Alan. I, I don't. I think it's more Alan just sorts sort of embodies uh, embodies things to people. Uh, either positive things or negative things. And, and, and I think that people, they sort of see him as a personification of something else and, and they react to it. Um, I mentioned in the book that after the riots in um, North Philly in 64, when the Phillies were out of town, they came back to Connie Mack and the crowd booed the hell out of them. Now, this is 64 before they collapsed. And Allen is going to be rookie of the year. He's having a great year. They booed the hell out of him. And, and, and it wasn't just a few people. It was, I think, one night there was um, uh, there may have been 12,000 people in the stands. And, and um, uh, the majority of those people were booing him. And every time he touched the ball, they booed. He never said anything about anything when it comes to that stuff or when it came to that. But they booed him. So, Mitch, what did you really find out? You said this was part of your quest. You know, at present day, here we are, like almost fifty years later, and we still had these, you know, diverse opinions about him. What still drives that today, especially for the negative side? 
I think, I, like I said, I, I, I think the thing with Alan is that he didn't really, he never, he didn't care so much about what people wrote or said about him in terms of, I mean, he did, but he wouldn't correct it. And so whatever you were gonna write about him, you could write about him. And, and he, you know, if it's gonna be positive, be negative, whatever. And I think because of that, there were writers, and remember this is the 60s and, and you, know, you know, times are changing, but also sports writing is changing. And in Philadelphia, that you've got two different types of sports writers in Philly at that point. You've got the old guys, the old guard, Alan Lewis. And, you know, Alan Lewis was a Philly's beat writer since World War II, <laughs> you know? Still the, he's still the beat writer in the, in the late 60s. He's still the beat, he's an old guy. He's still the beat writer. He was writing about baseball before there were black people playing baseball in the major leagues, right? Um, and so he's an old school guy. And, and and then you have the young guys, guys like Stan Hockman and Larry Merchant and those guys. And, um, and so they look at things differently. And so these guys didn't get along in, in, you know, in, in the Inquirer news office. And so they kind of played that out with how they, mm. how they wrote about Alan. And um, you know, not, Alan isn't blameless, but, um, but I think that people, the, the writers, they took out their, I don't know if it's frustrations or they kind of made their larger points about what they were seeing in the world or in Philadelphia through him, through Alan. And Alan didn't correct them. Um, not that he, he didn't see that as his job, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I noticed was really interesting to me when I was doing the research for the book was he didn't, or he, he said some things, like if you read, if you just read the dailies, you know, you read the Daily News, the Inquirer, the Bolton, you know, Bucks County Courier Times, those places. Um, you didn't really get much of Allen. You know, he didn't say a lot. But if you read the Black press, he spoke a lot. Um, so the, you know, the, the Black, the Philadelphia Tribune was a weekly. And so, you know, you, you know, they didn't cover every game, but there was always stories on him. And then in black magazines, and then that, and then in in um, the larger black press, the Chicago Defender, and all those you know, play uh, the, the the larger black papers that were circulated nationally, he spoke to a lot of people in there, and so you actually do hear a lot of Dick Allen. You just you don't hear it if you're reading the Inquirer, mm -hmm. and, and so if you're just reading the Inquirer and the Daily News, you're you're not going to really get to hear from Allen all that much. Yeah. Great. Well, I know we got a question from, from Tim here, which I ask you, and then and let's open it up for anyone who does have a question. And I know we're, we're talking about Richie Allen, Dick Allen, but uh, I know we got some fountain addicts out here as well, Mitch. So, uh, and I, of course, brought, uh, of course, my original copy of Ball Four <laughs> as well. So, so the question was, uh, what present day player most reminds you of Dick Allen? Dick Allen. I don't know if anybody reminds me of Dick <laughs> Allen. Because um, the thing is, like a guy like Dick Allen wouldn't stand out as much as he did, right, today. Um, because, you know, I think people are more live and let live um, than they were then. So I don't know. I mean, I guess the tendency to, is, I, I, you know, if it was a few years ago, people were always would say, well, Manny Ramirez, he was like a Dick Allen. But he really wasn't at all. Um, like a Dick Allen. Um, I don't know. I say I don't know if there is a comp, you know, uh, in, in modern day baseball because I just think he was, to the extent that he was reacting against something, he was reacting against a stricture that isn't there anymore. Um, you know, like um, he 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 was very adamant that he be paid what he felt he was worth, mm -hmm. and that's why he. He was, I, I believe, I don't think anybody has been able to dispute this yet. I believe he's the first player in Major League history to have an agent negotiate his contract with a, with a club uh, for him. I, I think he is. Um, and there's no official statistic for that, but I think he was. And um, the reason for that was because he was determined to get paid what he was worth. And he was upset that they would give him a hard time every year. Well, you know, in today's game, 
he would be a free agent after six years. Yeah. Uh, and and so he would, and if he wasn't happy in Philadelphia, he'd leave. And probably he would have left after his third year when it was arbitration eligible, right? They, you know, or they would have paid him and he would have been happier. Uh, so I don't know if, um, if, uh, if that really, if that really, you know, I don't know if there is a comp. Mm -hmm. I see Trevor Bauer there. I would not say Trevor Bauer. Um, I think, I think, from what I know about Trevor Bauer, I don't think Trevor Bauer and Dick Allen would get along. Um, um, <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I mean, Dick Allen was a generally good guy. I'm not so sure Trevor Bauer was a generally good guy. <laughs> yeah, that's that. That's funny because, you know, yeah, because I was I was going to ask you how Dick would feel like. Um, be nowadays, but you're right. There, there's free agency. I mean, we not just in baseball. We see it in other sports as well. If a player doesn't want to be there, they'll they can get out. There's some way that they can get out, or they could leave. So, um, I think you're right. I, I think it's very, it's difficult to envision. You know, anyone comparing to him. Well, you yeah, know, the interesting thing, thing about, about him leaving Philadelphia in 69 is that was after his sixth season. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we have free agency, he would have left anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but it wouldn't have been all the drama leading up to it. Um, you know, so, um, uh, it, 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 so it's like, if you know you've got free agency coming up after your sixth year, you know, you can probably deal with it a little bit better, you know. And Mitch, that yeah. makes it so interesting who he gets traded for, you know, to... Yeah, Kurt Flood. Right. So that's... Right. Yeah. And the reason, really, the, the reason Flood doesn't report to the Phillies is because of Allen. He, he, you know, later on, Flood made his case that it was not about the Phillies and it was not about anybody, anything in particular. It was the system. But if you go back and you read the contemporaneous stuff as it was happening, he was very clear that he didn't want to go to Philadelphia and be the next Dick Allen. And, 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 and the stuff that he was saying about what he had heard about Philadelphia was all stuff he had heard from Dick Allen. Hmm. So hmm. I think, you know, my personal feeling is, and I'll never know this, but I think if Kurt Flood had gotten traded to the Mets, you never would have sued baseball. Wow. Interesting. I, do you, it didn't seem like the Phillies really did him much favors either. If I felt like, um, and again, you're right. I, I know Allen's not blameless in any of this, but it, it felt like the Phillies kind of made, they could have helped make things a little bit better for him as he was coming up and then, and then playing. Yeah. I mean, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't have, they didn't really have a system for dealing with anybody who questioned anything. And, and, and then when you have, um, when you have a guy like Bob Carpenter, who, I mean, you know, on the one hand was, was pretty much of a racist. Um, and I think he at some point realized that he was on the wrong side of things and he kind of tried to turn it around there. But he he was, he just didn't know, he was just clueless. And and you know, whereas the Dodgers, they 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 did what they could to help Jackie Robinson, right? They 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 moved their spring training, you know, um, out of Florida. They put him in Montreal for a year. Um, you know, the Phillies didn't do that with Allen. And so, you know, not that. Not that um, other teams were that much better, but um, but the Phillies. I have to say, I mean, for I'm doing, I'm I'm working on a different project now, and I got to, I've I've been able to speak to a lot of people who played in the Phillies organization during the '60s, and it does not sound like it was a good place to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, it it, oh, wow. it sounds like a particularly bad place to be if you were not white. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard this from multiple players. And so, um, you know, a guy like Allen was a superstar. So at least he has that going for him, right? Mm -hmm. 
and they treated they treated him like garbage. You know, if you weren't a superstar, I mean, I can't imagine what that would be like. I mean, it would you know, it, it was it was not good. So yeah, I think again, you know, Alan. Even Alan admits later that he said I eventually became the person they always said I was. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, they said he was a malcontent when he wasn't a malcontent, and then he became a malcontent. <laughs> you know, he be, you know he started. They said he was never on time when he was on time, and then he stopped showing up on time. And as because he said, well, why should I bother showing up on time? They don't say I'm on time, so I might as well be late uh, because they're not going to. I don't get a break anyway. So why do I have to bust my ass to get here on time if they're not going to say I'm on time anyway? So yeah, you know, they kind of they kind of created a situation that um, you know he he sort of fell into. Uh, yeah, and he's not blameless, but um, but I don't think he ever said he was blameless either. So we got a question from Bob Morris here, uh, Mitch. Um, when Alan came back, he was embraced, wasn't he? Question mark. Uh, did fans wish they had treated him better earlier? Yeah, so when he comes back in '75, he um, he gets a big standing ovation, and um, yeah, he is treated better. Uh, I really think a lot of that is um, is is a lot of guilt <laughs> is going on there because these are the exact same people. I mean, the difference between '75 and '69 is six years, right? I mean, it's the same people. Uh, it really, you know, it's not even a generation. It's just six years later. It's basically, you know, somebody from the 2015 Phillies returns, right? I mean, we were all going to games in 2015, right? So that's the same thing. Uh, so yeah, I, I really feel like, I think that the world and America had changed so much between 1969 and 1975 that were, that what had seemed like a defensible position became completely undefensible by that point. And, I, and I, I, think, I think that there were people who didn't want to admit, come to terms with the reality that they were on the other side of that. Um, I mean, they, they, I think he got like 11 standing ovations in his first game back. Mm. Uh, to me, that's weird. Uh, to me, that's like, that's just like, you know, one, two, maybe. But you know, I don't know. The, I don't know the exact number, but it was a lot. It was like eleven. Um, that just says more about the people who were there. It's me. It says that there's a lot of guilt there. There's some embarrassment. There's some people who 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 don't want to own what happened before. Um, so I guess my take on it is that I don't really. I don't give. I don't give the I don't give the fans a pass on that because they gave a bunch of standing ovations. I think those are the same people. Mm. So, go ahead, Bob. You're going to ask questions. I was going to say there was a book written uh, a number of years ago about baseball, I believe, in North Philadelphia. And I think when I read that, um, it sort of opened my eyes to what it must have been like to be black and play baseball in Philadelphia. And and even back to uh, the '40s, you know, they gave Robinson. It seemed a rougher time than some of the others did. And I wonder too, when he came back, um, not wanting to pick on the Carpenter family, but the Carpenters were gone, weren't they, by 75? When Ruley he was, was still there. Was he? Okay. Yeah, Ruley was running the team. He ran it maybe like he had, too. He, what? Maybe it was different. And as you said, the times were different too. The times were different. Yeah, I mean, he was past his prime when he came back. Well, in retrospect, he was past his prime. But don't forget, he was the AL home run champ in 74. 74, right. Yeah, so he... he in 75, the Phillies had the reigning NL and AL home run championships. They had Schmidt and, um, and Allen. Oh, wow. oh. And Lozinski. Oh, your friend, right. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> and, and Schmidt actually speaks really well of, of yeah. um, Richie Allen. And it's kind of interesting. If you look at, I guess, Gene Mock and Tanner, Chuck Tanner, the managers, they, they, they all seem really supportive. And so that's so interesting when you say he's like, he's such a dividing guy but it sounds like a number of the players and also even some of his managers actually were pretty supportive of him yeah i don't think that i don't think that it was um he was not a bad guy in the clubhouse he, he was a quiet guy he was you know he kept to himself 
you know, maybe if you're looking to your, you know, if your best player to be a leader, you're disappointed because he's not, you know, he has his own schedule. He's not really looking to, he's not a rah-rah guy. And in fact, at one point he said, he got criticized for that. And he said, you know, this isn't, this isn't high school baseball. You know, these are, we're, we're all professionals here. You know, you know, when you come to the ballpark, you're here to do a job. And if you don't know that, there's nothing I can tell you that's going to make you do it. Um, you know, we're, we're adults and you got, you got to act like one. And in many ways, he was more, he was a lot more mature than the rest of them, you know, because you know, he knew it was a job. He, he knew he was there to do a job. And really, he knew what he needed to do to prepare for the game. And so, you know, and this is something that he said that he caught a lot of crap about, but that today he's been proven right. He, he, he said that spring train, the way they used to run it was a waste of time because it was all standing around. Mm. You know, you would stand around, you'd shag balls all morning. You'd wait for an hour to get a turn in the cage. He said it was a waste. He would rather go early in the morning by himself and he would pay a college pitcher like 20 bucks to throw him a couple of buckets of balls. And he would tell this kid, you know, here's where I, you know, these are college pitchers. So they're good pitchers, you know. And he would tell this kid, I want you to throw, you know, certain things here and there so he can work on specific things. And he said, I would get my work in before these guys even showed up. Mm. And I didn't need to stand around for four hours mm. and make pretend I was mm. a ball player. Mm. And so nowadays you look at spring training, it's not at all like what it used to be. Mm -hmm. You know, to have things broken up and, you know, it's much spring training now is much more efficient than it used to be. And Mitch, one thing I found surprised about Richie Allen, I mean, I've got all of these baseball cards and, you know, the Sports Illustrated coverage, but he wasn't really a huge guy. I mean, he was, what, 5'11", seemed like, what, 190? But his power, when they talk about his amazing power, um, it, it, he, he looks bigger than life. He looks a lot bigger than what he really was. Yeah, he was not big. You know, he had big, big uh, wrists, strong wrists, though. I mean, he, could, he could just whip that bat. You know, he had that heavy bat. He would just yeah. whip it. Let me just ask you two really quick questions that are more about Richie Allen, but um, one, and I don't know if your research and what you did on this, but where do you think he had his happiest time in baseball is number one. And my other question, because I, I grew up in DC along with my friend, Tim Ramsey, and we remember Hank Allen. Um, mm -hmm. What was the relationship with he and Hank Allen? And did they ever kind of, I don't know, commiserate a little bit? I mean, I would think that the experience in DC was a lot different than, the experience was in Philadelphia. Yeah, I think his happiest time was Chicago, where he was playing for Chuck Tanner, who who he knew from Newcastle. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think Chuck Tanner was there. I believe Joe Lynette was a coach there at the point at that point. Um, and he he liked it there. Um, he didn't want to go there, but mm. once he got there, and and um, Tanner convinced, and what's his name was also there. Um, What's his name? The president, Roland Heeman. Um, and so, you know, so that's a those are those are those are good people to be around. You know, Chuck Tanner, Roland Heeman, um, and 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 Alan liked them. And you know, he was MVP in '72. So I think he would say that was where he had the most fun. Um, in terms of Hank, that caused problems in Chicago because one of the enticements to get Alan to show up. To Chicago because I said he didn't want to go was the White Sox signed Hank and he was really I mean he was a marginal ball player to begin with but he was not only a marginal ball player by 72 he was finished you know he, he really he couldn't do anything but he needed like an extra year of service time to qualify for the pension so they kept him on um, they kept him on 72 and 73 until he qualified uh, and yeah, I think if you, I don't, none of those numbers are, but he hit like 180 or something. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't play a lot. And, and, and other people on, yeah, I don't know, not so much in that organization, not so much on the team, not so much the players, but in, in the press, they were like, well, why, why is Hank Allen there? You know, like, well, what's, what, yeah. And so that goes back to this idea that Dick Allen's a prima donna and he's dictating this and he's dictating that. Um, that was really more the White Sox trying to make him happy. Um, so he, um, yeah, he, he got along well with his brothers. Actually, I, I spoke to his other brother, Ron, last week. Hmm. Um, and um, so he's an interesting guy also. Very different from, from Dick. Uh, but um, 
Yeah, they all got along. Um, I don't, Dick didn't say a lot, you know? He wouldn't even say a lot. Ron said, said to me, he said, oh, look, Dick didn't say a lot to anybody. He didn't say a lot to me either. I'm his brother. <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, so yeah, I don't think that they said a lot to each other. Yep. But, um, but they were, I think Dick was happy he was there. Yeah, great. Justin. Yeah, hi, Mitch. Um, so I have an off-the-wall question for you. Um, that the, the Sports Illustrated cover of Dick uh, juggling the baseballs with the cigarettes, the cigarette right. mouth, what's the story behind it? Did he, did he used to smoke in the, in the dugout, or what, what's the story there? Yes, he did smoke in the dugout. <laughs> um, he, he smoked everywhere. Um, I think there's a story. I saw there was recently a story about that cover. Um, I don't know where I saw it, but if you Google it, you'll find it. Um, the guy who took the picture was interviewed recently about that cover. And I think, I think somebody named like one of the most iconic Sports Illustrated covers ever. <laughs> and he said it was purely just pure luck. He was on the field and somebody said, what, hey, look at that. And it was Alan was smoking a cigarette, juggling in the dugout. And he quickly <laughs> snapped the picture and that became the cover that week. Um, yeah, I just think he was just, I don't know what he was doing. <laughs> it's a great cover. It is. Absolutely. So Mitch, let me, if I can, I, again, and it's open to everyone, but I, I do ha get to get, have to get to Bowton because I have heard you speak before and it was almost, you know, uh, when you said how you had your discussions and you met Bowton and then when you started going through the box, with the various kind of notes or anything like that. If you could just, I guess, share with everyone, what was that experience like? Oh yeah, so um, yeah, so when I when 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 I when I first met him for this for the book, I had met him before, but to go for the book, um, he he was really he was very excited to show me all this stuff, and so. Um, it's really, it was interesting. Like you go, like, so he, we would talk in this, in this sunroom um, and, um, and it was a very nice room. And it's a very, you know, it's funny. You go in that, into his house, there was no baseball memorabilia in that house. I mean, mm. um, nothing, nothing. Um, but, um, it, you know, it, it was a pretty, it, it was interesting. You would not expect, at least I didn't expect that. But anyway, um, in the basement, that's where all the stuff was. And it was all in boxes. And so we, we spoke for a while and then he, um, we started talking about the note taking and he said, well, do you wanna see the notes? I said, sure, why would I, wanna, why would I not wanna see all that? And so he goes downstairs and he brings them, brings them back up. And so they're in this box, as I say, and there's a chapter in the book, the butter yellow box. And he opens up the box and he starts going through the notes. And these are the notes that he wrote on the, the barf bags and the hotel stationery. And it's just oh, wow. their observations and there's things he heard, um, all sorts of stuff. And he, they're, they're really full of stuff. I mean, like he would take a barf bag and he would write on the side, then he'd flip it over on the other side and he'd write along the margins. I mean, there's snakes around and around and around. And um, so, I, he, you know, we, we were going through it and he, you know, I could see, I, I, the reason that I wanted to go through it was just to see what was in it, you know, but then as we start to go through it, he's the one who has the box and I'm off to the side. And so he, he starts going through this stuff and you can see him getting lost in like the mm -hmm. memories and just, you know, like you could see him start to just fade back into 1969, he's with the pilots. And, you know, he would talk and then he would kind of fade. And you could see that something, he was thinking of something, he, it, something had triggered a memory. And it was really something to see. And as I said before, it was like, I didn't come to see that. I came to see what was on, written on the paper. But the more interesting thing was to watch him go through the notes. Because when you watch him go through the notes, you could see how much that these, notes meant to him and the whole experience had meant to him and how it was such a profound moment in his life and now we're at the end of his life and he you know he, he at this point he is aware that this is the end of his life because he's 
you know, he has this brain disease and, um, you know, he had, he struggled with accepting that for a while, but he had accepted it by this point. So he knew, you know, the science says you've got a couple of years if you're lucky. And so he knows that this is really the end and, and he's going back and thinking about this time, this highlight of his life. And it was, it was really quite a moment. And I, I did not anticipate it being as, um, as, as, as profound a moment as it was. And it really was um, just to see a guy sort of take the measure of his life as he's going through these papers in this mm. box. And it was really, it was really something. Wow. Well, again, let's open it up to anyone else. So Mitch, was there anything, and this could be for either one Dick or Balton, doing your research and going through going through this that that struck you about them or or about their experiences that really you know kind of stayed with you i know you just shared the story about Balton, but anything else that kind of just really resonated with you well one thing that resonated with me about Balton was how um how unsure of himself he was mm. like um so like i mean i don't know like, how much how much you know about Jim Mountain, but he kind of comes off as a cocky, swaggering, wise guy, you know? Um, that's his persona, you know? Um, he would go on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and he was, you know, very confident, full of, you know, just, he exudes confidence, this guy. But he really wasn't, he really was unsure of himself. And, he, and that came through, um, it came through when I did my research, but it also came through when I would talk to, um, him and uh, his wife at the time, who said that he, uh, she wanted to introduce him to some of her friends because they had been dating for a while. And this is, this is Jim Bowden circa, this is 1985, 86 already. So, you know, this is post ball four, right? So he's a huge celebrity. Um, anyway, so she wants to introduce him to some of her friends and he, he was very nervous about it and he was not, he didn't really want to go and she couldn't figure out why. And she asked him why, why, what's the big deal? Do you, you know, when you're too big to visit, you know, to meet my friends or something. And he was like, Oh no, I don't see what, what about me they would find interesting. Uh, <laughs> what do they, what do they want to talk to me for? Like, I don't feel, feel like there's anything there for me to talk about. Um, and this is Jim Bowden, right? I mean, Everybody knows who Jim Bowden is, um, but he, that's just how he was. I mean, he, and so one thing that I found when I, when I was doing the book that, you know, his nickname was the Bulldog, but that was like, that was a persona he put on to overcome all this self-doubt because he was not the most talented guy. Um, he was, he was a good athlete, but he wasn't the best player anywhere. And he would put on this persona of this, this, um, you know, this cocky, swaggering, confident guy to get him through the periods of self-doubt, which to me, I thought that was pretty interesting and surprising because I, I did not anticipate that at all. But as I said, not only did it come through in the research, it came through when I met him. It came through when I spoke to him, you know, uh, and everybody I spoke to who knew him said the same thing, you know, it's like, yeah, you'll be surprised if you spend some time with him that he's not at all like this guy you see on TV. He's, he's a completely different person. And he was. I've got a question uh, going back to Dick Allen. How much was Allen bothered by not being the Hall of Fame, my guess? Um, so I, I think the interesting thing about Allen, I think when it comes with that is I think I think it bothers him more or bothered him more than he said it did. I also think that like, you know, um, he wouldn't campaign for it. Um, whereas, you know, the thing that you do if you're a retired ball player and you're kind of, you know, you're, you know, if you, you know, you're not Hank Aaron, right? You're kind of a, a borderline uh, candidate. The thing you do is you sort of, you make the rounds, you do the circuit, you know, you, you, you basically play to the crowd and talk to everybody. And he never did that. And the reason he never did that, I think, was because he didn't feel like he would have earned it 
if he had done that. And so he felt like I deserve to make the Hall of Fame on my own and I shouldn't have to do anything. And so, you know, or, or I don't deserve it, one or the other. But the fact that I go around and sit for an interview with Sports Illustrated or ESPN shouldn't play a role in whether I get elected to the Hall of Fame or not. And I think he felt it would cheapen the whole thing <laughs> if he did that. Um, so he never did. And so that's why when he would be asked, does it bother you? He would say no. But he talked about it a lot. So, you know, I think it bothered him more than he would say it bothered him. But I don't think it, it wasn't something that he was willing to sacrifice this idea of what, what he, why, how he should get in. And so he wasn't going to do anything. And that would frustrate the hell out of, um, you know, uh, all the people who tried to gin up a campaign and they did gin up a campaign for him. Um, it would have been more effective had he done something, but then if he had done something, it really wouldn't be Dick Allen then, would it? It would be, you know, <laughs> it would be something else altogether. Mitch, I saw something, I didn't read all into it, but that Bill James said that Richie Allen and Rogers Hornsby were the two most controversial. And I guess that means from a, maybe from a statistical or how to look at it, but maybe that's not, but did you see the same thing? And what does that mean? I don't know what he compares, puts Rogers Hornsby in the same category as Richie Allen. Yeah, I think he had a whole essay on Hornsby and, and what made him controversial. But I, I think, so Bill James has two things he's known for when it comes to Allen. One is that. And the other is the statement he made, um, I think in the Hall of Fame, he made he wrote a book on the Hall of Fame and he said that Dick Allen hurt his team, did more to hurt his team hmm. than any other player in baseball history, something like that. Hmm. Um, and that keeps getting brought up. Hmm. Um, so that part I think is just, it's weird that it came from Bill James because Bill James is usually, you know, he looks deeper into things and Dick Allen is a guy that James would like. I, I don't understand what the issue is with Bill James and Dick Allen because Allen's, you know, Allen's analytics, his metrics are really good. I mean, he's the kind of guy that Bill James would champion, right? Um, and Bill James used to write articles all the time about, um, uh, 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 you know, Sparky Anderson used to talk all the time about team chemistry. And, um, and James would respond by saying, that's, that's garbage. You know, the Reds don't win because they have team chemistry. They win because they have Joe Morgan and Pete Rose and Tony Perez and Ken Griffey. I mean, that's why they win. Yeah, of course, you're going to have chemistry when you have basically eight guys who could be in the Hall of Fame, you know. So, so that's that. But as for the other one, yeah, I think he was talking. I can't remember what he said about Hornsby, but he, you know, Hornsby was an odd guy, I think. Um, he had some, he had like, I can't remember exactly what the article was, but it was, I remember Hornsby being an odd bird and I don't remember exactly how, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I think it was within that context. But that, that may be a more Bill Jamesian take. <laughs> yeah. The other one. Yeah, which is, as you said, it is odd. Yeah, it is but, odd because you think of the era that Allen played in the ballparks that he played in and statistically, analytically, you would think, wow, that would be a, a star you know, for, for James. So it is kind of weird that he bring in this personality issue into the discussion. Yeah, I mean, he, he was playing in a, in, in a pitcher's era and he was, you know, one of the top handful of hitters during that era. I mean, really, who else is it? It's going to be him, Clemente, Aaron, Mays, you know, Frank Robinson, you know, those other, those other guys are, are lock Hall of Famers. You know, Allen isn't a lock Hall of Famer, but he's a pretty good player. I mean, you know, if you're going to be in that group, you know, okay, maybe you're fifth in that group. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll be fifth in that group. I'll take fifth place <laughs> in that group, you know. Um, but I don't, yeah, I don't understand what the, why all of a sudden with Dick Allen personality became an issue. I, I He's never said anything about it since then. Yeah. I don't know why. So just Charles, because, uh, go ahead, me. please, go ahead. Uh, Charles Alexander uh, wrote a book uh, Rogers Hornsby and uh, Alexander um, uh, mentions thoroughly the issues that uh, Hornsby had with with the various teams that he managed and coached uh, and even some of the uh, other areas of baseball that uh, that uh, he was involved in uh, plus plenty of the horse betting how how he borrowed 
money from friends and things like that. So uh, Alexander mentions Hornsby's um, antisocial personality uh, was a factor. Yeah. So that so that that comp makes more sense. Yep. Well, Alan was a horse horseman too, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He had horses. He owned horses. He wasn't. He would bet on them a little bit, but he was mostly into. Um, he liked he liked horses. He had horses on his. You know, he had a farm. Um, which I'm told is not technically Percocy, but I always call it Percocy. Um, but um, yeah, he had a he had a farm, and he always had horses. And, and he, when he when he lived out in near Santa Anita, he would always be there, and he had some horses who were there too. So yeah, and his brother was a um, um, was a groomer, I think, for a while. So Mitch, another question on our on Dick Allen and my. If you Mike asked about as far as a comparison to Dick Allen and Albert Bell. Uh, um, also kind of a controversial, but what a powerful hitter during his time period. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting one. Um, I mean, Bell was a great hitter for a, for a period of time there. Uh, another guy with uh, two names, right? He was Joey Bell for a period of time. <laughs> That's right. Um, when, I was, I, when I was in college, I went to Tulane and Joey Bell played for LSU at the time. Um, so I remember I used to, you know, I did like um, some, I, know, I did like some play by play on the local radio, you know, the campus radio station for baseball a couple of times. And one of them was LSU and, and Bell was there. And um, yeah, he could. He was. You could. It was him and the, that pitcher. Who was the pitcher who was taken number one overall by the Orioles? Donald. McDonald, right? Yeah, yeah. Pat McDonald. Yeah, he was there too. Um, yeah, those two guys are like on a different planet <laughs> from anybody else <laughs> who was there. Um, yeah, Bell's an interesting guy. I don't know. He just kind of disappeared. I don't know why. I mean, maybe I don't know. It was a steroids thing, or I don't know what. But I don't know what happened to him. Because for, for a period of time, he was a great player. Yeah. But then it just disappeared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with the new kind of like, I guess, voting committees uh, for the Baseball Hall of Fame, what do you think as far as Allen's chances now? I, I mean, they always change, you know? So you never know yeah. um, what, what's going to be. I guess it depends who's on the committee. I, I would think... I would think he has a... I mean, he missed by a vote before, but it's going to be a different committee... Um, and he's no longer alive. I don't know. I mean, I, I would say the odds are he gets in, but I don't, I don't think they're tremendous odds, you know, <laughs> like, you know, maybe a 51%. Cause I think, you know, you just get, it just takes, you know, four people on that committee, like 12 out of 16. So five people on the committee. And everybody only can vote for a certain number of people. So the math is really weird. Yeah. You know, each, each person only has a certain number of people they can vote for. And I, I read some piece a few years ago that explained like, it really makes it impossible for somebody to get in because if you've got three or four people who are all pretty good, well, just by their, if enough people split their votes, it's impossible for anybody to get 12 out of 16. Yeah. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. So, do, you, do you have a sense, like, is there any individual or a group of people that are kind of lobbying for him that, well, yeah. have, that, that could sway, that could sway the vote? That could sway the vote? I don't know. I mean, Mark yeah. Wagner has been doing that for the last several years. Yeah. Um, he's pretty successful at it. You know, he gets a lot of um, um, attention, which is good. Um, but I think that's kind of the group. Um, I know Schmidt has said he thinks he should be in the Hall of Fame. Um, so, you know, um, but you know, I don't know how much that, how much weight that holds. I mean, there are also guys in the hall of fame who say, well, if so-and-so gets in, I'm never coming back to Cooper, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. not, not Alan, but you know, generally the steroids yeah. guys. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I think, you know, I think he has a good chance, but again, you know, if you're going to put him in a ballot with, um, Hodges, Hmm. Leva, right? Um, and um, 
probably a couple other guys who are guys who are, you know, right on the cusp there, you know, and everybody has their own guy that they like. They can split the vote again and, you know, we're back to where we were before. Yeah. So did, let me ask one of the questions about Dick Allen. Did, did he and Frank Thomas, did, did they kiss and make up or was that just kind of a fictional story? Oh, yeah. Um, and well, those, you know, according to Thomas, they, Thomas they, says they did. Yeah, and for those who might not know, I mean, this was the famous incident where Thomas, they had the fight and Thomas takes a bat right to Richie Allen, correct? Yeah, yeah. So Thomas, Thomas is still around. Um, okay. He was in Western Pennsylvania. I think he's like 93 or something. Um, so yeah, Thomas, Thomas says they did. Um, and, you know, I, I, Mike Tollin is making a movie, a Dick Allen movie or something. And he interviewed Thomas and you know, Thomas, personally, Thomas, I think is just full of crap. And, um, and, and he'll say anything to make himself look good and which is what he was doing in the aftermath of what happened in 65. He was, he was lying through his teeth after in the aftermath of that, you know, cause the Phillies, the Phillies released him. He didn't have a gag order. Allen had a gag order after that fight and all the people in the Phillies had a gag order. So they weren't saying anything. And Thomas was talking to everybody left and right saying, you know, this is what happened. And, and, it, and it wasn't, you know, he had put a spin on things that was just not accurate. And um, so, you know, and, and then later on, Thomas says they will exchange Christmas cards. And you know, maybe they did. I don't know. Or maybe Thomas sent in a Christmas card. Um, I mean, I'm sure that happened. But um, I also am pretty sure that Dick Allen never was cool with Frank Thomas because Frank Thomas, it was not, this, this, this was not just a bunch of guys who on a hot day, you know, their tempers flared. Thomas had been riding the black players on that team for the since he had gotten there the summer before, mm -hmm. and and it wasn't just Allen. It was it, it was all of the younger Johnny Briggs. It was all of the 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 younger black players. Um, you know, Allen had made it clear to Thomas beforehand. You know, don't mess with me. You know, um, and, and so Thomas basically left Allen alone, and picked on Johnny Briggs. Um, and picked on some of the younger guys, uh, younger black players who really didn't have the stature of mm -hmm. Allen. And, you know, but then, you know, then he said something to Allen. And, and, um, and so that's why Allen went at him. And then that's when Thomas hit him with the bat. But uh, I can't imagine that Allen ever became good with Frank Thomas. I, I just, I don't see it. I mean, sure, he might have said, okay, whatever, don't worry about it at some point. But they're just two different people living in different worlds. And, and I don't think Frank Thomas's world is one of contrition at all. So if, he, if it's not, then Dick Allen isn't good with that or wasn't good with that. Well, Anthony, you want to wrap it up? Yeah. We're at the top of the hour. Mitch, thanks so much for, uh, for giving us your time tonight. It was great, great getting to know you and, and, and hearing those stories. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, again, I, you know, I'll try to get some more events going, uh, going down the road and, um, want to thank you all for joining us and thanks again, Mitch. Really appreciate yeah. it. And Mitch, well, thanks for having me. It was and Mitch, great. I was going to say for a plug, as far as those interested in getting your books or books, I should say, what's the best way to do that? Oh, so, um, you can get, I guess Amazon is probably the best. So you can get Bouton and, uh, the Dick Allen book. They're both both available on Amazon, or you can get them through bookshop.org if you want to support your independent yeah. bookstore. Um, you I know, bought probably, Dick Allen as I was yes. sitting here tonight. So, so what? I say I bought the Dick Allen one as I was sitting here tonight. Oh, nice. Oh, oh cool. Well, thanks. Awesome. <laughs> Hope you like it. Good. Great. Great. All right. Thanks, thanks again. Much. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. -bye.